We are in chapter 7 this morning. So uh, if you brought your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, if you if you use your phone or uh, if you have your Bible on your phone, you can uh, use that as well. Uh, so Paul, in his uh, epistle to the church in Corinth, uh, uh, is, is bringing them truths, which the Holy Spirit is in, inspiring him uh, to present to them. And in, in the seventh chapter, Paul is actually responding to questions that they have asked him. So he's actually writing back on certain issues uh, that they need to know the mind of God on. And so he's responding to that. Uh, and so we're going to spend time uh, in chapter 7. Uh, uh, and uh, like many of us, they also had questions on sex in marriage, sexuality. They had questions on, you know, uh, different dispositions in life. What do I do uh, if I'm like this? Uh, this is my situation. What do I do, especially in the context of marriage? Uh, you know, what if I'm married to a non-believer? I'm married to somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus. You know, what am I supposed to do? Uh, if I'm single, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? And all of those kinds of things, all related to uh, marriage. And that's what chapter 7 is all about. Just one disclaimer before we proceed. I, I would rate this sermon PG-13, so parents, <laughs> in case you have children sitting with you, if you don't feel comfortable, you are advised. <laughs> or if you feel that children shouldn't be sitting here, you have been advised. <laughs> so I've broken, we've broken chapter 7 into six sections. Uh, and we will cover these uh, section by section. The first section are the first six verses where the Apostle Paul is talking about the importance of sex within marriage. We'll read the first six verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and it, let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife, to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. So let's look at these verses. Verse 1, he obviously is telling them that uh, concerning the things that they had written. So they had sent in a written request, maybe like a QA, QA type thing. You know, here, Paul, here are all our questions. Can you please provide answers? <laughs> so he's saying, look, to so the questions you've written to me about, I'm responding to that right now. And he says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, understand uh, you know, the word touch is not used in that sense of, oh, don't touch, don't shake hands, you know. So don't leave this place this morning saying, I heard verse 1, I can't touch, shake hands, no. The context obviously is having sex, being uh, uh, a sexual relationship because he's going to continue talking about that. Um, he says, nevertheless, verse 2, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So he's saying, look, you get married. Because uh, we don't want people to fall into sexual sin. So you get married. So to put it plainly, put it very plainly, in order to avoid sexual immorality, get married. However, this is not the only reason why you get married. <laughs> All right? Yes, he is saying that. But that is not the only reason uh, that you get married. Uh, Paul in his other epistles and Peter in his epistle has other insights that, that they bring about concerning marriage. Uh, uh, great, great, great insights on what marriage is all about. But in the, all of that, this is one reason. In order to avoid sexual immorality, get married. Verse 3, 
Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. So he's saying, look, in a marriage relationship, there has to be this expression, this giving and receiving of affection. And sex is one of the ways in which this happens. So sex inside of marriage is one of the ways that you do express your affection towards your spouse. It's not the only way. But it is one of the ways. And I want just to highlight these three words, render, affection, and due, that, he, that we have here in verse 3. The word render is a very interesting word in the Greek. The word there, it literally means uh, that you're giving away what you have, you're giving it away, but actually for your own benefit. Very interesting. You're giving it away, you have something, you're giving away, but you are going to benefit through your act of giving away. So render, give away what you have, but in the process you are actually benefiting. It also means, of course, you're paying off a debt. That means you're giving something that you actually owe the other person. Render. Second, the word affection. Greek simply means an expression of your goodwill, your kindness. So in marriage, there has to be this rendering of affection in so many different ways, one of which includes your sexual relationship between husband and wife. And the word due, that is, you actually owe something. You actually owe your spouse this giving of affection. You know, many times we get into marriage saying, my spouse owes me. Hey, wake up. You owe your spouse. You owe something. Render affection that, you, that is due to your husband or your wife. You owe that person. So, Here's an important perspective about sex within marriage that, you are not, uh, that you know, I'm specifically talking to married couples, others, please hold on, you know. Uh, but when you look at sex within marriage, you, you and I should understand this, that our, 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 our approach should be, I owe you and I'm giving you what I owe and I know I will be blessed as I bless you. Not the other approach that says, you owe me, and I'm demanding you pay me right now. That's wrong. But you look at it as, I am rendering, I'm giving something to you, but I know I will be blessed. And I'm rendering to you what is due to you. Husband, look at that, in that sense, towards your wife, and your wife, do it that way towards your husband. Verse 4, he says, you know, I want you to understand the wife doesn't have authority over her own body. Similarly, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body. But in marriage, you're actually placing your body under the authority of your spouse. And of course, you're doing it willingly. Not because your spouse is demanding. But it's actually what you can call it a conjugal privilege. That you are choosing to submit your body. Bring it under the authority of your spouse. There's only one person on the entire planet who will have that kind of authority over your body. That's your spouse. And he says, you bring it under authority. To your spouse. If you're enjoying the same man, otherwise it's okay. So please understand what Paul is telling us here that you're doing this willingly uh, and so on. And then and, and the husband or uh, the wife, you know, of course, you're not going to mistreat or abuse this position of privilege that you have. Verses five and six. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Then come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, Paul is presenting another very important perspective of why sex is so important in marriage. He's saying, you know, don't deprive yourselves of this. You know, and please do not use sex as a weapon against your spouse. You didn't treat me well, I'll tell you for the next 30 days. Don't use it as a weapon. He says, do not deprive each other. Because when you do that, you're actually engaging in something that is very self-destructive to your own marriage. It's going to destroy that marriage. Why? Because he explains to us that Satan can take an advantage of that kind of approach. So don't deprive. Because Satan will take an advantage of that. So here you see, if you look at it from a positive, uh, or a, or a positive light, 
sex inside of marriage is actually a protection for your marriage. So that Satan will not be able to have entrance in that particular area because of your lack of self-control is what Paul is saying. So you can put it like this. Uh, when a husband and wife, they withhold affection and sex from their spouse uh, and they're using it as a weapon to get their demands, they're actually engaging in self-destructive behavior. Or if you put it in a positive way, uh, a husband and wife who have strong affection and a good sexual relationship within their marriage, they're actually protecting their own marriage against what the enemy might try to do in that area. Now I understand that, uh, you know, uh, there are some situations, practical situations, where a husband and wife may not be able to uh, engage in, in sexual relationship within the marriage, physical reasons, other reasons, but they can continue to show affection in the marriage. They can continue. But that showing of affection is so important in a marriage. Otherwise, Satan can use that lack of the rendering of affection due uh, or uh, the lack of uh, sexual fulfillment. He can use that as a point of attack uh, because of our own weaknesses. You with me so far? All right, some are. Uh, verses 7 through 9. Then Paul moves on to talk about the gift of singleness. He says, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul was single as he's writing this. And so he's saying, look, there is this blessing of being single, but each one has his own gift from God. Verse 7. So whether you're married or whether you're single, both marriage and singleness are gifts from God. It's very interesting that word gift, he uses the Greek word charisma, which is a gift of grace. That means God is putting grace on your life for to be in that state of a single a married. There's grace on you. And that same word he uses later on in chapter 12 when he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's very interesting. There's a gift of grace that empowers you in your state of singleness or being married. Uh, that, that enables each of us in whatever state we are. And uh, they are gifts from God. And keep in mind, neither one is greater than the other in terms of our spiritual standing with God. Uh, verse 9, he says, but, uh, you know, it's good if you can stay single. That's great. I will explain a little later on why it is good uh, uh, to be single. But, he says, if you cannot, verse 9, if you cannot exercise self-control, uh, that there is this burning passion in you, then he says, it's better to marry rather than to remain in the state where you're burning with passion. So he's saying there's nothing wrong in getting married. And you know that part of the reason is not the only reason. Part of the reason is you do have sexual appetites that need to be legitimately satisfied. So there's nothing wrong in getting married. Now, we should not misuse or misunderstand verse 9. So what do you mean? You know, sometimes a young person will read verse 9. And Paul said, you know, you cannot exercise self-control. He said, I have no self-control. Uh, he said, let them marry, but I can't get married. I'm burning with passion. So what do I do? So I'm doing A, B, C, and D to satisfy my sexual appetite. Now listen, you cannot, don't use verse 9 to condone wrong ways of satisfying uh, sec your sexual appetite. There is a right way. And at the right time, and until then, there is grace available for each one of us in the state in which we are. Whether you're single or you're married, there's grace available. Uh, also, I need to point out here that it is wrong to think that, you know, if you get married, your sexual bondages will go away. Now, a person, if, if you are in sexual bondage, meaning if you are in bondage to... Uh, uh, wrong kinds of sexual activity, whether it's pornography or other kinds of things, 
don't have this idea because of verse 9 that just because I will get married and all these bondages will go away. Marriage is not a cure for your bondages. Are you listening? That has to be dealt with by the power of God. And you need to get help in that area uh, and learn how to live an overcoming life in your area of sexuality. Receiving the grace of God while you're single to live godly life. Marriage is, uh, 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 provides a legitimate means to satisfy the sexual appetite. But marriage will not cure or not deliver you from sexual bondages. That's a totally separate thing that, need to be, that needs to be addressed. Let's move on to verses 10 to 16, the third section here. Paul now begins to talk about people who are in different marriage situations. What do you do? So he begins to address that. They probably asked a question along these lines or a few questions along these lines. And so he's addressing that, verses 10 through 16. Now, to the married, I command, yet not I but the Lord... A wife is not to depart from a husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to a husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who does not believe and if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, a wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, a husband, whether you will save your wife? So he's addressing two situations here. One is where both the husband and wife are believers. So that is verses 10 and 11. So he says, to the married. Obviously the inference is there that both of them are believers because in verse 12, he addresses a different situation where one of them are not believers. So to the married, where both husband and wife are believers, he says, look, no separation, no divorce. Both parties, husband and wife, have equal responsibility to protect the marriage. If one of them chooses to depart, then the only option is they remain unmarried or they be reconciled. They've got to come back. Now, there are biblical grounds for divorce, and I'll just make mention of it, although that's not the main subject here. The point here Paul is saying is, as far as a Christian marriage is concerned, separation and divorce are not God's intent. They're not God's will. So you make every possible effort to stay in the marriage. If you have to be separated for a period of time, for whatever reason, maybe there are, there are, there's a, a marriage problems and, and, and you're working on it, you're getting it sorted out. Ultimately, you need to be reconciled. And that word reconciled there is a very uh, interesting word. Uh, it, it talks about mutual change, mutual change. Uh, really, it has a picture of e exchanging coins for another set of coins that are of or equal value. You may give, you know, uh, two five rupee coins. The other person may give a ten rupee coin, whatever. There's an exchange of coins. But your mutual, so it's mutual. There's equal uh, effort that's going in here into this whole reconciliation. Many times you sit down with, you know, couples having problems and, and the wife says, it's all his fault. He needs to change. Or it could happen the other way. You know, the husband says, she needs to change. All her fault. No, reconciliation is not like that. It's mutual. Both have had a part to play in whatever caused distress in the marriage. And both are equally responsible. Should take equal responsibility in the process of reconciliation. It's, it's mutual. You're exchanging coins. The number of coins you exchange may be different, but they're of equal value. They both have to come together in order to be reconciled. Now, you know, uh, Paul is very clear. A husband is not a divorce's wife. Divorce is not... Uh, for, for us in the Christian marriage. Uh, in the Bible, you will, you will see there are only two 
kinds of situations where divorce is permitted. And Jesus himself uh, mentioned this in Matthew chapter 19. One, the, uh, when there is a violation of the marriage covenant. And I want to highlight the word permitted. Meaning divorce is not commanded, it's permitted. Meaning you don't have to use it. If you can forgive, even if, uh, if, even if the marriage has been violated uh, by sexual uh, immorality, by adultery. Uh, even if it has been violated, you have the option of forgiving. Yes, you do have the option of divorce in that situation. But you also have the option of, of forgiving and seeing that marriage restored. So, uh, uh, biblically, a, a marriage could, divorce could happen if there's a violation. Or if there's an abandonment of the marriage covenant, which we will talk about. He mentions a little later in verse 15. Uh, uh, so, in, in these two situations, yes, a marriage uh, may be absolved. Uh, a divorce can happen. But it is not commanded. It may be permitted. That means you still have a choice. Verses 12 to 13. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband and does not believe, he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. So to the rest, that means if you're in a marriage situation where your spouse is not a believer, what is what is God, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, I, not the Lord. That means, I, I don't have a definite word from God on this, but I'm bringing you the mind of the Lord. And we can trust that because Paul knows the mind of the Lord. And he's saying, I'm saying this. The, what God wants is for you to stay in that marriage. So even if your spouse at this point in time is not a believer, don't use that as an excuse to walk away from your marriage. Stay in it. God wants even those situations, those marriages to be preserved. And he gives this amazing thing in verse 14. He says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Or the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. In other words, this is so amazing. Just because one of the, one of the spouse is a believer, the whole family, the other spouse and the children, are now set apart in the eyes of God. God looks at them as special. Are you with me? Right? Just because there's one believer in that family, God looks at them as special. He says, this whole marriage or this whole family is set apart for me. Because there's one person here who believes in me. Now, please, single people, wake up. I'm talking to you. Please don't use this verse as a license to go get married to an unbeliever. He's talking about people who are already in that situation. Okay, the Bible is very clear. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. So don't. Okay, don't use this verse. Ah, oh, the believer sanctifies the unbeliever. Hallelujah. So <laughs> I go get married to somebody who's not a believer. No, you don't use that verse that way. Because he's saying if you're already in that situation, then this is what, how God sees your marriage. But if you're a single person, you always choose, to make the choice to be married to another person who is also a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Then he says here in verse 15 and 16 that if the unbeliever departs, that means if your spouse chooses to leave the marriage, abandon the marriage. So this is the second case that we made mention of. There's an abandonment of that covenant. The unbeliever departs, then he says, look, you're no longer in bondage. You're not obligated to stay in that marriage. The marriage may be peacefully absolved and you can move on. Verses 17 to 24. So now he addresses another uh, uh, important question that, that they would have asked. Uh, it has to do with their state or their station in life. Let's read this passage and we will explain. Verses 17 to 24. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. I mean, this is a practice across all churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. 
For he was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. So what is the issue he's addressing? You know, they probably had questions like this. Hey, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm uncircumcised. I became a believer. Should I get circumcised now? Should I become like a Jew now? Or these were uh, circumcised people, Jews. They became believers now. Do they need to become uncircumcised? Uh, somebody was a slave. He becomes a believer. Hey, do I need to now uh, get out of you know, this whole position, how do I get out of being a slave? Uh, should I be a free man? You know, so all these questions are what he had already addressed. You're single, you're married, or maybe you're separated, or you're divorced, or you're remarried. All these various stations in life. Do I need to change it now that I've become a believer? Meaning my social standing in life. Do I need to change it now that I've become a believer? And what Paul reiterates about three times is this. He says, look, you... Wherever God has called you, and whatever God has distributed you, verse 17, you stay in that place. Don't think that you need to change your station or your state right now in order to follow Jesus Christ. Remain there. Remain where you are. And he repeats that again in verse 20 and verse 24. Remain in the calling in which you were called. Stay there. In other words... Don't think that in order to serve the Lord, in order to serve God, you need, you know, to make changes to your social standing or you know, your profession or your vocation. God is not demanding that. So how do we apply it to our context? So today, maybe you're a working professional. Stay there. Serve God. As long as, you know, be a working professional. Serve God. You can still serve God. You can still honor God. Don't think, I need to quit my job if I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. No, you don't. You stay there. Until, of course, maybe God does call you in the future. Sometime in the future, he may call you. Fine. That's fine. But right now, you can still walk with God. You can remain with God. You can grow in God. You can honor God right where you are. If you're single, don't think, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. When I get married, then I will serve the Lord. No. Serve the Lord right now as a single person. Uh, you know, whatever ways you can. The marriage will come. In God's way, in God's time, it will happen. Or if you're married, please don't ever think. Once I get single. <laughs> this is an irreversible reaction. <laughs> okay. You're married, you're married for life. Right? So don't think like that. Whatever state, whatever God has bestowed on your life right now, just serve God, honor God. Now, of course, he does mention that if you're a slave and you can get free, okay, that's fine. You know, you get free and you can serve God. Uh, if you can, you know, improve, make your life better, that's great. It's okay. But don't think you need to necessarily change things in order to live for Jesus. I want to bring your attention to verse 23. He says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. You know, the same statement he said earlier in 1 Corinthians 6. In talking about living free from sexual sin. He says, you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And he's repeating the same statement. You are bought with a price. So don't be slaves of men. Don't come under anybody. Now, you got to understand the scripture correct. Don't go tomorrow morning to your boss and say, boss, yesterday in church, I read that verse. The Bible says, don't be slaves of men. <laughs> so I'm not going to listen to you. No, you can't do that. You and I have to submit to whatever leadership uh, uh, that is above us. And we have to walk in honor towards that. The point here is this. Don't put yourself in a place. Know that you belong ultimately Jesus Christ. He has bought you. So don't put yourself in a place where your life is being dictated and controlled by another person. That's the point, right? You do walk in, in honor of, of, of leadership and, and people who are uh, uh, given oversight over you, whether it's in a workplace or your home or wherever else. But the point here is this. You belong to Jesus. You follow his plan, his purpose for you. Are you with me? Right? So that's the point. Now let's go 
to the next section, verses 25 to 35. Just two more, and then we're going to take time to pray. Verse 25 to 35. Now, concerning virgins, that means those who are unmarried. Young people, this time you can wake up now. I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that it is good because of the present distress. So he's, he's talking about a context, situation that was happening at that time. Because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, an unmarried woman marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, she will have, nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. And those who weep, as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice, as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy, as though they did not possess. And those who use this world, as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. He who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you. That means not, I don't want to bring in bondage to this. But for what is proper, that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So, this passage here is not necessarily a command from God because Paul begins by saying, you know, I have something to say to you, those who are not married, but uh, it is not a commandment, but it is more of what I would present to you as is, is pleasing to the Lord. So uh, we will just, you know, present the essence of this passage. What Paul is saying is this, that when if, if, if you remain single as Paul was, he says, you have this opportunity to stay focused on God, to be able to serve the Lord without the encumbrance of earthly responsibilities. Uh, and that's the benefit, is what he's pointing to. But he says, whether you're married or whether you're single, regardless of what, how you, what, what you, how, in what way you're, you are in this world, he says, I'm calling all of us to live in such a way that we are not engrossed or absorbed by the world. Because you know that the things of this world are passing away. But bring, our, bring ourselves to a, a place of focus and undivided attention on the Lord. Are you with me so far? So that's the essence of this parrot passage. Now he's also referring to a context that was there at that time. He's talking about this present distress. What was that? At that time, Christians were being persecuted. Nero was the emperor, and he was out killing Christians. And he's saying, look, given all these things that are happening around us, and the intensity of what is happening, uh, uh, don't get, at this point, don't worry too much about getting married. That's the context in which he was addressing this. Are you with me? Right? So uh, that, well, that's what Paul is saying here. Now, what, what I want to uh, uh, just highlight from here is this. Paul is not, in this passage, he is not, for, he is not forbidding to marry. He's only saying that if you remain single, you will be able to give you more undivided attention to our primary objective of serving God and focusing on God. That's what he's saying. Because when you look at uh, his writings in other places, and remember the simple thing, scripture must always be interpreted in the light of the rest of scripture, right? So if you look at Paul's writings, for instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and in verse 4, Paul clearly stated that in the last days, people will forbid to marry. And then they will say, don't get married. And he refers to that as doctrines of demons. So Paul is very clear. He's not forbidding to marry. In fact, he says, if somebody is teaching you not to get married, that is actually a doctrine, as a demonic teaching. Doctrine of demon. Are you with me? So 
this passage uh, is really Paul's push or encouragement for us to stay focused on God regardless of what uh, you know, we are involved in. Now the last passage in the end of this chapter. Verses 36 to 40. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then, he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. Now, these three verses, verses 36 to 38, are very difficult to interpret because we don't know the context or the question, the specific question that Paul was answering. Uh, it could apply to two contexts. Verses 36 to 38. One situation could be, A, situation A, could be referring to a young man who is engaged to a young lady. That is one context. So he's saying, young man, if you can't, hand, if you can't handle it, it's okay to get married. But having read whatever I've said, that if you remain single, you can focus on God. Now, if you don't want to get married, that is also fine. That's a better part. Are you with me? But it can also be applied to the context where it has to do with a father deciding whether he wants to give his daughter in marriage or not. And remember the custom of those days where it was a father's decision what happened to the daughter. Ladies can say amen. Thank God. It's not. <laughs> Today you have the liberty to make decisions. But in those days, the father decided whether he wanted to give his daughter in marriage or not. And so he's addressing that kind of situation where he says, Father, you know, if your daughter has reached this age where she's got to get married, and if you decide to give her in marriage, it's fine, perfect. But if you decide not to give her in marriage, well, you've, you, uh, because of what he said, that she could focus on the Lord, she wants to focus on the Lord, and so therefore you decide not to give her in marriage, you've chosen a better part. It's very interesting when you look at different translations of the Bible. There are certain translations of the Bible that translate these verses in in the context of a the first context there are translations of the bible that translate it in the context of b that is in the second context there are some translations that just leave it for you to decide which is what king james and new king james does this this is a translation the context is what we are not specifying because we don't know and niv does something very interesting niv gives both and now in the international version, in the text, it presents it as A, that is one context. And then in the footnote, it gives you context B. So I'll just read both out for you and we'll close with the, looking at the next verse. Look at NRV in the text. It says this in the text. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably towards the words that he's engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. Just go through the marriage preparation course. <laughs> but the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and was made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man has also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, and he who does not marry her does better. Then all this in the light of what Paul has said prece preceding to this verse. Look at the footnote in NIV. This is what it says. If anyone thinks he's not treating his daughter properly, so this is context B. Do you see the difference? If anyone thinks he's not treating his daughter properly, and if she's getting along in years, or if her passions are too strong, and he feels she ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. He should let her get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind to keep the words in unmarried, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who gives his virgin in marriage does right, but he who does not give her in marriage does 
better, right? So both contexts are addressed. So keep in mind that there are these passages where we, we don't know what the actual context was that he was addressing when he was writing because we are 2,000 years, year, years later that we are reading the text. There is nothing wrong in the text. Don't go from here and say there's something wrong in the Bible. No. There's nothing wrong in the text. These are words inspired by the Holy Spirit are coming to the mind of a man of God who knew the mind of God. It is just what we, we are lacking is we don't know that particular context that he was addressing. Are you with me? All right? Thank you. All right. <laughs> Verses 39 and 40. So in verses 39 and 40, he talks about a wife. If she loses her husband, she does have the liberty to get married again. And that is fine, he says. But just in keeping in light of all, all that he has said proceeding to this, she is happier if she remains as, he, as she is so that she can focus on the Lord. And that's in line with all that he has said. Amen. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Amen. All right, so we're going to take some time now to pray. I just want to pray over us uh, in general, uh, all in the light of what we've heard right now in the area of marriage. And then we will just uh, uh, pray for other needs as well. So let's take a few moments to pray, please. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, we pray right now for marriages, for married couples, Lord. We pray your blessing over every marriage. Over every marriage. And Father, we pray that as your word says, we will receive and walk in the grace that you bestowed on us as married couples. That we will be able, Lord, to render the affection due to our spouses. I pray, God, that every marriage will be rich. Will be rich in affection, in understanding, in experiencing the goodness that you intended when you designed marriage. We pray, Father, that there will be a hedge of protection around every marriage, Lord. That Satan will have no point of entry, no point of access. That our marriages will be divinely protected against every scheme and every wile of the enemy. And enable us to walk in the grace you have allotted for us as married couples. as husbands and wives. And Father, we pray for those marriages that might be going through difficulties. We ask for your touch. We ask for your intervention, God. We ask that there will be mutual understanding that both will take equal responsibility to build their marriages, build and strengthen, Lord, the relationship. We pray your grace to empower them, even in, those, in, in that area, God. Father, we pray for every single person, every person who's single here. We thank you for your grace over their lives. We pray your wisdom, your empowering over them, and your grace enabling them to walk in righteousness, holiness, purity. We pray your provision for the right life partner for them. That you bring in the right person for each one of them. So they too can step in and enjoy a good married life. We thank you, Father. And Father, we just pray for those who We're going through difficulties. We're going through challenges in their present life situation. Maybe going through a divorce. Maybe through a very hard separation. Maybe some other challenge that has come upon them, Father. 
We thank you that you are good to all. Your tender mercies are over all your people. We pray your hand lift them up. We pray your hand encourage their hearts. Because God, in your own way, because you are God, you're able to bring beauty out of ashes. You're able to rewrite their life story. You're able to give them a new beginning. You're able to put joy and rejoicing in their hearts, in their lives, in their mouths. And we pray you will do that, Lord. For those who presently might be going through a hard time in their lives. We thank you, Father. We honor you. We bless you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's rise to our feet, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you. I want to take a, just f take a few more moments here just to pray. If there are people here this morning, you've, you came to church, you didn't come expecting to hear about sex and marriage, but you're here. But more important than all of this is your relationship with God. There is a God in heaven who loves you, who cares for you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for each one of us so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could come into this relationship with God, we can know Him, we could become His sons and daughters, that He would be our Father, and that He would lead us in the rest of our lives. So we want to give you that opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into your life, to come into this place where you are a son and a daughter of God, God becomes your Father, and you let Him lead your life this day forward. So I'm going to say a simple prayer. If you have never received Jesus into your life, I want you to pray with me. If you've never done this before. And say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I want to lead us in a simple prayer on that first. So let's just bow our heads, please. And if you have never received Jesus into your life, you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, but you'd like to have that happen to you today, right now. I want you to pray with me. To say this with me, please. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Be the Lord of my life. I believe you died for me on the cross. And that you rose up again. And that you're alive today. Help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time and you've never done it before, but you did it right now, just want you to raise your hand this morning. We want to celebrate with you. Anybody in this place, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. I'd like to see your hand if you did this this morning. Anybody here? I don't see any hands. Okay, I see one hand. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Just keep your hand lifted up. There's somebody else over here. I'm not saying. I just keep your hand lifted up so that we, uh, our, our, our greeters will come to you. And they'll give you this green bag. It has some resources in it. We call it the Believer's Bag. And uh, and uh Along with that, they'll give you a card that says a decision card. If you just write your name and number on that, and please hand it back to them. Uh, uh, then we will be in touch with you. We'll teach you or we'll call you and tell you how to use the resources that are in that bag. So if you pray that prayer, please make sure you receive the green bag. Just keep your hand lifted up. Somebody will come and give it to you. Or on, on your way out at the exits, there will be people with this green bag. Just go to them, tell them, I, I need that. Uh, they'll take your contact detail and just give you the bag, the resources in it that will help you in your walk with God. So let's just pray and we close this morning. 
Uh, I want to call our uh, ministry team up, life group leaders. So could you just come up here? We're going to make yourself available to pray for people. Just come together as couples or uh, 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 life group leaders. Just come on up here. We want to make yourself available. If you need prayer this morning, we're going to dismiss the service, but you need ministry. You need healing. Uh, you need deliverance. You, you, you need a breakthrough in your life. Our leaders will be here. Our life group leaders will be here to just pray with you, minister to you. So you can come to any of them. Uh, they'll be standing in groups of two or they'll be standing as husband, wife, couples. Just come to any one of them and receive ministry. Uh, they know how to pray, whether you need healing, whether you need deliverance. Or there could be some other issue that you need prayer for. They will be there available to pray for you right after we dismiss. And the Lord will work through them uh, ministering to you. Let's just close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always in jesus name amen amen thank you for listening we trust this message was a blessing to you for more free resources including sermons sermon notes tv programs publications please visit apcwo.org for information on apc bible college in bangalore please visit apcwo.org slash bible college Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.